revelations to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is a rather fetching song by Nat King Cole called Nature Boy. I first heard it sung by David Bowie in Baz Luhrmann's colourful and evocative movie Moulin Rouge. The song goes like this. There was a boy, a very strange, enchanted boy. They said he wandered very far, very far away over land and sea. And then one day, one magic day, he passed my way. And while we spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. Those of you who know the song are familiar with that tune. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. It has been four weeks of songs. Well, last week particularly was a really joyful week of singing, a Sunday of singing. We have heard over the pulpit the Magnificat, Mary's Song of Hope. We have heard the Benedictus, Zechariah's Song of Peace. We have heard the Gloria in Excelsis Deo, the Angel's Song of Joy. And today, as we close our series of Advent Songs in the Dark, we hear the Nunc Dimittis, Simeon's Song of Love. And for Simeon, like Nature Boy, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is to love and be loved in return. I wonder what you feel like when you see a video of yourself. Like currently, as I look uh, onto the camera, I can see right below the camera a video of myself um, preaching. I wonder what you feel like when you see yourself on camera. Now, this past year, we've all been, become acquainted with video conferencing apps like Zoom, right? Or Microsoft Teams or FaceTime or whatever it is uh, that you use for work or for conversations or for hangouts. Now, something that really bothers me whenever I catch a glimpse of myself, as I am doing right now, um, um, something that really bothers me, sorry, is when I catch a glimpse of myself, as I am doing right now. Good Lord, who is that old man staring back at me? Is my hair really that grey? Does my face really have three chins? That can't be me. I always look bad in videos or photos. My effusive, three-dimensional personality can't be captured in a two-dimensional image. I suppose I could just say, well, Nat, when your diet is 50% pizza and 50% McDonald's, what do you expect? Maybe that's really what I look like and I should deal with it. But no, I tell myself, that's a really unflattering angle. Dean, can you please change the angle? Perhaps I should invest in a better video camera that better reflects how I really look like and who I really am. Now, in other words, that is not really me. I know who I am. I know who I am. Do you? Perhaps you're more wonderful, more exquisite in looks, more intelligent, more character, more taste, more talent, more style than anyone could ever describe or say. But do you really know who you are? One of the features of our culture with its obsession with youth, with outer beauty, social media networks and the transitory love of the latest fashion is that it becomes tempting, almost unavoidable, to try to present ourselves to one another at our best. Now, isn't that, in essence, what a Facebook or Instagram page is? It's a chance to say, hey, all of you, look how meaningful and fun and brilliant and quirky I am. We are constantly making it easy for people to understand who we really are, 
how brilliant and unthreatening we are. One thing people have started putting on resumes is a little line under their name that says goal or uh, aspirations. And what follows is a succinct but gen generic summary of everything they have to bring to the world. Something like, I am a high achiever who selflessly wants to use my outstanding gifts with inevitably less wise and less talented people and to apply my mastery of all skill and technology, including that which has yet to be invented, to bring about lasting change in the world. When we are immersed in such a culture of enhanced appearances and fleeting connections, it's very hard to answer the question, who are you? Instead, we are constantly answering the question, who can I persuade others that I am? What we call successful people are those who've convinced a large number of the public that they're brilliant but unthreatening. And that's why successful people often find the question, who am I, a bit hard to answer. Because they've peddled their publicity so many times, they've started to believe it themselves. Now recently, I had to preach a homily at the last day of the Chinese annual conference to the delegates there. Now it just happened that that day coincided with the day of my ordination. And I deliberately chose to preach on the theme of dust to remind myself that ordination is not success by the world's standards, not a calling into the heights of fame or glory and power, but a calling into a ministry that is found deep in the dust of the earth. This reminder is especially important to me, and I mention this because I want you to know success is a drug that makes us think that our identity and our character are products that we can market to unwary consumers. We think we are fooling them, but in the end, the one that we are really fooling is ourselves. By contrast, if you think about this year, 2020, if you've had months or years out of work, when you've had the courage to admit that the one thing in life you truly want has not happened for you, when you've experienced a terrible illness or injury, that's left you in need of long-term care, or when you have had to bear a deep grief or sorrow, or if your family have had to bear a private burden together that if exposed would bring down a cloud of shame and public scrutiny. If your story sounds something like this, then the likelihood is you do know who you are, even if who you are is a daily struggle with distress, disappointment, or despair. That's one of the few things a genuine experience of deprivation can give you. It can give you a deeper understanding of who you are. Luke's Gospel tells us the story of a man named Simeon. Simeon doesn't have a website. He doesn't have a Facebook page. No one knows who he really is. Simeon was a common name of first century Jews, you see. We know he couldn't have been Simeon, son of the famous Jewish teacher Hillel and father of the rabbi Gamaliel. Later legends about Simeon suggest he was a priest and a successor to Zechariah. Some even suggest that James's speech in Acts 15.14 refers to this Simeon from our reading this morning. But these are all as educated and uh, guesses as they are, at the end of the day, speculative. They are compelling in their own way, but the truth is we really don't know who Simeon is. We can't say with 100% certainty that this is the Simeon that we're talking about. In this story, Simeon is simply a common, ordinary man. All that Luke wants to know about Simeon is that he has been waiting literally his whole life to meet the Messiah, to meet the Christ, to meet Jesus. He has been waiting, says Luke, for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was with Simeon, and the Spirit had told Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the Christ. And so Simeon waited. He probably had his everyday routine. Wake up, brush his teeth, eat breakfast, check email, log on to Zoom, make some calls, write some documents, maybe log on to Facebook, watch some videos, log on to Zoom again, check email, repeat. Day after day, it was the same. Week after week, go to the temple, 
worship God together, do the rituals, pay the tithes, say the prayers, sing the songs, faithful and consistent, boring even, watching, waiting, longing for love's consolation. His very life depended on this waiting. And in a real sense, he was undergoing a lifelong deprivation, waiting for life's true meaning. Now, eventually, God leads Simeon into the temple, the moment that Jesus is brought there to be presented to God. Now, the person that Simeon has been waiting for his whole life appears. Now, his life makes sense. It has been such an awesome and glorious fulfillment that Simeon cannot help but break into song. And the first line of the song is where we get the name Nunc Dimittis. That's the Latin translation of the first line of verse 29. And in essence, Simeon says, Thank you, God. Now I am ready to die. Now I am ready to die. To this wizened old man, seeing this little baby is so emphatic that his life culminates in this one moment. Even if he was married, we don't know if he was. Or had children, we don't know about that. Or was a rich man, we don't know about that. Or had many friends, we don't know. Luke doesn't tell us. All we know is that all of the sum total of his life pales in comparison to this one moment of meeting the little boy, Jesus. His whole life, his identity is entirely caught up with who Jesus is. If you ask Simeon over and over again, who are you? His answer would be, I can't answer that question except in relation to Jesus. I can't answer that question in, except in relation to Jesus. Now later in this service, we are going to joyfully witness our brothers and sisters gathered here declare their identity in Christ. I want now all of you at home or here, whether you are baptized, about to be baptized, or considering baptism, or have never considered baptism, to think about those words for a moment. Who are you? In the waters of baptism, Christians since the earliest days of the New Testament have been saying, I cannot answer that question except in relation to Jesus. Who are you? In the waters of baptism, we say, I cannot answer that question except in my standing with Jesus. Is that your answer? A few years ago, I came to know about this French film called A Very Long Engagement. It tells the story of Mathilde, a young woman from northwest France who is crippled by polio. She falls in love with a young man named Manek. Manak goes off to fight in the First World War, but before he does so, the couple seal their love and their promise and promise their hearts to one another. Manak takes a knife and carves into a trunk of a large tree the capital letters M, 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 which stands for Manak loves Mathilde. That's how the French verb for love is pronounced with the M, a silent A. <coughs> M, 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 Manek loves Mathilde. Manek repeatedly carves these three capital letters on trees and paints them on walls wherever he goes. It is his signature tune, his logo. It's the one thing that he is absolutely sure about himself and wants to tell the whole world. But things don't go well in the trenches of the First World War for Manek. He's accused of injuring himself to avoid combat and he is caught martialed. As punishment, in the middle of the Battle of the Somme, he is pushed up and out of a trench and into no man's land. That's the last anyone ever hears of Manek. His beloved Mathilde refuses to believe that this is the end of the story. After the war, she hires a private investigator and searches high and low for him. She finds a letter from another soldier in the trench. The letter describes Manek's final walk into no man's land, and how even at that point in no man's land, he was last seen carving into a tree the letters M, M, M. She realizes that even on the brink of death, the one thing he knew about himself was his union with her. 
But she didn't stop there. She continues her investigation, finding that Manek had received a pardon from the president of France, but that the pardon had been suppressed and hidden by his commanding officer. Now, eventually, her search bears fruit, and she discovers to her unbridled joy that Manek survived the ordeal. It's still alive. It's being cared for in a community, and in the final scene of the film, she is reunited with her beloved fiancé, Manek with one difference. He is a changed man. He doesn't know who she is. He's lost his memory. He doesn't remember anything about their love or the war. He just doesn't know who he is anymore. Now, this is where the story ends. But I want you to imagine with me this morning how that story might continue. Loving this man, having spent so long searching for him when everyone thought that she was crazy and obsessed and chasing an impossible dream, having finally found him, surely the story is not going to end there for her. Surely she's going to stay by his side until he learns to love again, until life comes back from the hazy memories of war and comes into focus. Even if he can never remember their youth together in France, before too long, all his life and memories and impressions will be infilled, infused with Mathilde, just as they were before, only in the present. It's not hard to imagine that one day again, perhaps without knowing that he's done it before, and that he did it at the defining moment of his life, Manek might one day carve M, M, M into the letters, those letters into a tree again. The truth is, he doesn't know who he is without Mathilde. He never did. And now, on the other side of war and hell and oblivion, he will never have to know himself without Mathilde again. This is what Simeon's song is saying to us. It's saying, I don't know who I am. I only know who I am in relation to Jesus. I don't have any purpose in life, any goals, any satisfaction, any bearings, any wisdom, any security, any identity aside from who Jesus is. Jesus is the way I know who I am. I invite you to think back to the story of Mathilde and Manek and their very long engagement. I want you to imagine yourself as Manek and Jesus as Mathilde. Imagine the story in three scenes, one before the war, one in the heat of battle, and one after the war. Some of us identify with the story before the war. Manek can choose any number of paths in life, but he chooses to associate himself with Mathilde. In just the same way, for many of us, Jesus is simply a choice amongst others, a figure with whom we could choose to identify and our faith is something from which we could theoretically disengage ourselves, just as it's possible to disengage oneself from an inner, inauspicious engagement. In this scene, you don't really need to love Jesus or the church. Being a member of the church is like being a member of a gym or a country club. You can be committed. You can go weekly. You can pay the fees regularly. But the moment you are unhappy or unfulfilled, you can leave. There's no loving commitment like Simeon. But others of us might see ourselves more in the second scene, at that moment when Manek has been rejected by his own superiors and thrown into the wilderness of no man's left land and is facing his near certain death. Here he knows no other truth other than Mathilde, which is why he carves those letters even before he walks into no man's land. Will that be you, moments before you die? Will you know no other truth than that Jesus loves you? Will all you know be that Jesus carved his love for you onto the trunk of a tree and has been carving it ever since? And yet again, others of us may feel that the most profound portrayal of our faith comes in the final scene of the film, where Mathilde, who has already given so much and loved so deep, 
and such so far begins to whisper words and make gestures of faithful abiding love to a man who no longer knows who he is or even who she is. Here we are, like Manek, not knowing who we truly are, where we are, what's going on, hidden away in our little self-absorbed existence. And here is Jesus, kneeling beside us, whispering, playing, teasing, drawing us into this new world that we half remember and half yearn for, a world that we partly resist and partly embrace. But without Jesus, we will have no idea of this world, this life. And scarcely do we realize that it's only possible because of this same Jesus who is now revealing us to this world. And one day, like Manek, we may carve our love onto the trunk of a tree. I love Jesus. But we may do so blissfully unaware that Jesus has been carving his love for us on a tree even before we did. This is why Simeon's song refers to Jesus as, I quote, the salvation prepared in the presence of all people. When Jesus came as a little baby, his love drew into the gospel ordinary muddy shepherds, foreigners like the Magi, a virgin teenager, an adoptive father. If you read the other Gospels in Scripture, Matthew's Gospel tells us that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus fled to Egypt. Egypt, once a prison for the Israelites, but by God's love now turned into sanctuary. This is how Jesus' love changes everything. Without Jesus, we don't know who we truly are. You can discover your home, your tastes, your dreams, your colours, your careers, your rhythms, your learning styles, your academic interests, your psychological metrics, your DNA, your genes, your ancestors' homes, your voice, your family tree. These can all be very helpful in their own way, but none of them will disclose the most important thing about you. Like Simeon, what really matters about us is to what and to whom we witness. A 20th century French priest had the answer to the question of what is a witness. He said, to be a witness consists not in engaging in propaganda or even in stirring people up, but in simply being a living mystery. It means to live in such a way that one's life would not make sense if God does not exist. I offer this charge to our brothers and sisters here this morning preparing for baptism and to all of you listening in. Will you live in such a way that your life would make absolutely no sense if God did not exist? That's the answer. Simeon's life may have been an absolute mystery to us, but he knew who he was. He was a living mystery whose life made no sense if Jesus had not come. Maybe you feel that your life makes no sense right now. Maybe you don't know who you really are. Maybe your life is a mystery even to yourself. But Jesus has carved your name beside his into the trunk of a tree. Jesus is calling you to be a witness of his love. Jesus is kneeling beside you, whispering your memory and imagination into a life for which he has searched you out and for which he has made possible for you now to enter. Jesus is the living mystery in whom alone you can discover who you truly are. In the end, as Simeon's song reminds us, life's true meaning is not found in soaring achievements, scaling the corporate ladder, scoring the best results, surveying the world, or securing the shiniest, most expensive things. Like Simeon, a whole life spent waiting in the most unremarkable of circumstances can be redeemed 
in an instant encounter with Jesus. When you meet Jesus, you can even, like Simeon, confidently embrace death. You see, my beloved brothers and sisters, Nat King Cole was almost right. But Simeon grasped truth itself. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is to be loved by Jesus and to love Jesus in return. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray this exquisite, mysterious, and dangerous prayer. Lessons we learn from Simeon's song. Let our lives now, let everything in our lives now make absolutely no sense unless Jesus is in it. Help us to define ourselves not by what we do or have or accomplish, but to say our lives shall only make sense in relation to who you are. Shake us, Lord. Stir us. Trouble us, agitate us, provoke us, comfort us. Until the day, like Simeon, we see you face to face. Amen. Church, we have now come to a very exciting point in our service where we will be witnessing the baptism of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so now let's pro proceed to the baptismal covenant. Uh, I have a slide to be on screen as I introduce this next portion of our service, the sacrament of baptism to you. Next slide, please. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through confirmation and through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. I present for adult baptism, Lee Yoklan Pepsi. <laughs> 